So, um, welcome to the last regular talk before tonight's keynote. Uh, it's cool to see that many faces, um, although it's quite late already. So let's get started. Um, this is me, I work for those guys, and um, I'll talk about that in a bit, because everything I tell you today is based on experience on a real-life project by that company. Um, I also do some open source stuff, um, mostly working on five, but that's a different topic. Because today we want to talk about microservices, and you probably already have heard quite a lot about that, because it's still an ongoing hot topic on almost every conference. Um, so even on, on this IPC, we already had two sessions um, dedicated to microservices, and there's one more coming up tomorrow, I believe. Um, so including this, we're at four already, and there are probably a lot more talks that deal with microservices but don't really have it in their title. So um, it's, it's still a hot topic for everyone. Everybody talks about it, and a lot of people finally have started using it, and at least in my perception, the general tone of the talks dealing with microservices have become a little less, um, let's say, optimistic. Because now people have started using it in their own projects, they have production experience, and maybe found out that it's not always the perfect approach for their project. Um, while preparing this talk, I stumbled upon a manifesto um, that I want to get started with, um, done by a couple of smart people in 2009. And most of what is stated here would actually apply to microservices. So this might as well be a microservice manifesto, um, especially statements like, um, we pr prioritize uh, intrinsic interoper interoperability over custom integration, shared services over specific purpose implementations, and flexibility over optimization might as well apply to microservices. Instead, this is the SOA manifesto, service-oriented architecture. Um, and that's not really a surprise. I mean, having services and encapsulating functionality into services is actually not really new. We did that before microservices. And we, for example, called that SOA. And if we look at a very simple example of that, uh, we have several services dedicated to a certain set of functionality. Uh, we have some core applications sitting at the top. And in between, we have a communication layer and in SOA, that's usually the enterprise service bus, which already sounds pretty crazy, and it has enterprise in its name, so that's always something where people step away from. And actually, the ESB might have been one of the issues with traditional SOA, because it was too complex um, to use. Um, so it never got the amount of attention that microservices get today. So maybe this actually was the issue with that. If you look at a classic microservice architecture, it's very similar. We still have those specifically built services. We have some core or orchestration application sitting on top. But here we have a much more simple communication layer, at least for us, because we usually use HTTP to talk to those services. And um, that's a lot easier than having a new entry in your tech stack for communicating. Now, with microservices, um, the term alone can be pretty misleading and confusing because nobody can really tell you what micro means in this context. Um, we generally say a microservice encapsulates a certain functionality, maybe a certain domain in your business, um, but that doesn't say anything about size. So um, if you think about the word microservice, you might think of, okay, I, I need to have something that's very condensed and like I put all the functionality in a very small, tiny component. So sizing really isn't that easy in microservices. So um, the same example, but instead of a product service, we have a pricing service and a product text service. And of course, we would need to have a lot more services if we do this on this fine-grained level. And that might be fine. It's highly depending on what you want to do. Um, companies like Amazon do it on, on this kind of level, so they have a lot of services. Um, for you, that might just be too much. So sizing is hard to do, and um, 
Most of the time, that's because it's also hard to figure out what your domains are and which functionality can be encapsulated in decoupled services. So that's why uh, microservices is actually pretty close to what domain-driven design teaches us. If we got domain-driven design right and we know about our bounded contexts, then we pretty much also know what our services will be because we have the bounded context defined already. So if you try to use microservices, on the other side, you're kind of forced to think in domains and bounded contexts. Well, sizing isn't easy, but there are certainly some don'ts um, and best practices and rules that we can apply to our services almost all the time. So here are a few examples. Um, we go back to the simple example. Let's say this is some e-commerce application. We have a service for product data. We have a service for the cards of customers where they can add items to. And we have a checkout that deals with the whole business logic of checkout rules, like which shipment methods and payment methods do I need. Now, this is all fine. Um, and some things you really shouldn't do is like this, you know, have dependencies between services. So service A should not talk to service B because then you will end up having chaos because you don't know what the communication ways are. All your services have one clear API to the outside world. That's the only contract they offer to the outside. Um, also, that goes for every kind of data source. Normally, each service should have its own data source. And um, you shouldn't access that from any other point in your application. So the service alone owns the data source, and it does not expose that to any other service. And of course, that also counts for the core application. So core application also only knows about this API and obviously shouldn't go to some database that's owned by a service. All right, um, next point might be a bit more controversial because I think it's done quite often. You might come up with a chain of services. So you have a product service sitting on top that to the outside world provides you all the information regarding your products. Since that can be quite a lot, you might come up with adding more smaller services and those are being consumed by the product service. So you build a chain of responsibilities here and I personally don't think it's a good idea to do that um, because it will also add a lot of complexity to your whole infrastructure and your general architecture. That might become pretty hard to maintain. Okay. Um, all this, what we saw here, is using HTTP, right? I mean, usually you have HTTP communication and you use RESTful APIs probably because everybody does that. Um, that's nothing that is dictated by microservices. You could essentially do any kind of communication and data structures you want. Um, and more and more people start to use alternative communication layers. And that might end up looking like this. They add a message queue between the services and the core application, which is fine, but we're back to the enterprise service bus issue again because you add more complexity to the whole infrastructure and communication here. And with this, it might become easier to accidentally let services talk to each other instead of going through the core application and orchestrating everything from there. So this could be interesting. OK, um, one thing we really learned when applying um, the first sort, set of microservices is that it also highly depends on your development team, or more clearly, your teams. Microservices are autonomous. They are decoupled from outer dependencies. So they are not relying on outside technologies or anything. And for us, the same applied to the teams implementing those services. And it says teams intentionally because personally, I believe if you work in a team with like three or four developers, microservices might be too much overhead for you. A cool thing of microservices is that you can distribute development of services over multiple teams. So if you have three or four development teams in your company, it's very straightforward to basically assign services to teams and let them develop that autonomously. Because that also gives the development team the freedom to make 
decisions within their domain, within their service, and they are independent of the other teams. Of course, that leads to problems. So, back to our simple services. Um, let's say we have three teams, and each team is responsible for one of those services. That has the benefit that each team becomes a domain expert for that domain over time, because, well, they have to know what the checkout rules are in order to build a proper checkout service. But since they're autonomous, and they are able to take their own decisions, we could end up having something like this. Every team is able to make their own decisions, so team A says, we know PHP, let's settle with that, we build our product service with PHP. Everything's cool. Team B and C, well, they, they are a bit bored, so they want to try out something new, and they decide, okay, let's do Scala, or maybe Go, or whatever's hip at the moment, um, because this is a cool way of, uh, for us to learn a new technology, because we are in our own world, we don't have to deal with anything in the outside world, right? Um, well, same goes for secondary technologies, like databases and data sources, but that's a different topic, in my opinion. This is really problematic, because with that, you tightly uh, couple your services to the team. Because it will be immensely hard for someone working on a product service um, to switch over to the checkout service, for example, um, because they have to get used to the new language and all the tools are different and it will be totally chaotic. Um, of course, if all use the same technology, there's still domain knowledge missing, but at least you don't have to deal with all the technology issues because you know, know your way around and your IDE and the tools. For secondary technology, that's kind of natural. We do that all the time, and it does make a lot of sense because for each service, we might have totally different requirements regarding what we need to store and how we need to store it. Um, we learned a lot from a video series released by Spotify uh, a while ago. Um, they reported very openly how they organized their development teams, and it's, it's a lot about culture and not much about technology. Um, we learned a lot from that. We actually copied some of their organization structures, how they do cross-functional teams. Um, it's really cool, and the videos are really worth watching because they, they explain quite a lot on how cross-functional teams work and also how you can organize multiple development teams. And in those videos, um, there was one key statement that really sticked in my head. And they said, um, the teams need to be loosely coupled, basically like your services, but they also must be tightly aligned. And that's very important, because alignment among the teams really empowers them to make decisions on their own without really um, drifting away from the overall goals that the whole set of teams has. So what they do is each team um, has different disciplines, so there's a back-end developer, there's a front-end developer, QA, product management, everything you might need. Um, and they build so-called chapters um, over those teams, so every back-end developer is part of the back-end chapter. And they have usual um, meetings, like once a week, probably, and they discuss decisions, they discuss technical issues they're facing, usually before actually taking decisions. Um, so if a new technology needs to be introduced because a service really requires that and there's no way around it, it is bounced with a chapter before the decision is actually taken. That allows you to define overall goals and visions and guidelines, and then within each team you can follow those guidelines, but you can still be autonomous because you can take the decisions on yourself. So you really only consult the chapter, you don't ask it for permission. And that is something that helped us greatly in organizing the teams, and which also might help you greatly when writing microservices, because you can define standards for each service, so you always use a certain kind of framework, you always use a certain kind of technology for your use cases, and only if you really have to drift away from that, you discuss that with the rest of the chapter, well, and then you may drift away from that, but you have those standards. Okay, um, so much for that. I want, want to go into details on the actual use case that we had for microservices, where we found microservices useful. 
Um, for that, I need to give you some background information on what we do and how we did it and um, what we're doing right now. So as I said, um, I work for a company called Kartenmacherei, which is based in Munich, and we make cards. It's a web-to-print company, so you can um, order wedding invitations and birth cards, but also photo calendars. You can customize them in many, many ways, and, well, they get sent to you. And for that, we have a pretty straightforward e-commerce site where you can order your cards. So this is a category page, and you see a lot of products here. They all have different uh, colors and formats, and, well, the rest is like the usual e-commerce stuff. When the business was started a couple of years ago, um, they used a standard e-commerce system, and it's, well, what you'd expect a couple of years ago, there was a huge monolithic application. There's a subtle hint, maybe it's too dark to see it, which system we used, but it's not too important anyway, but because everything we tell you is pretty much counting for, the, for every kind of system like that. So we had this monolith, and um, well, it was very slow. We had performance issues. The developers didn't want to touch the code base anymore. We couldn't do upgrades properly. We, we had all the usual legacy problems. And um, I'll give you a brief explanation. There's a whole talk about that. Um, I'll send around the link later if you want to go into details there. But what we did was um, we didn't replace the whole legacy application in one step because that would have been a huge project, unplannable and far too big. So we decided to only step-by-step step move out functionality into new software. We started with what we had the most amount of pain with, and that was category pages and product pages, because they were pretty slow, and users tend to, lead, tend to drop off really quickly if the page doesn't load fast enough. Uh, we had a lot of caching issues with Varnish, and it was really messy. So that's what we focused on first. And we built a new PHP-based uh, front-end application, which would handle requests. And the general idea, very briefly explained, is that when a customer goes to a category page or a product detail page, in traditional systems, like the one we used, um, you go to the database, you grab data from multiple tables, join them together, put them into some data structure, hand them over to the template engine, template engine produces HTML, and then it is sent back to the client. And that takes quite a while. I mean, that's why you usually have caching in front of that, because you don't always want to go to the database. But the thing is, those pages will always look the same. So for each request, the data that is eventually returned to the client will be identical. So why render it all the time? That doesn't really make sense for us. So um, the approach is to have a key value storage, and that key value storage ideally contains everything pre-rendered, all the HTML we need to serve. So all the front end would have to do when a request comes in is go to the key value storage and say, hey, I have a request for this category ID, please give back the HTML for that. And you would get the already created HTML and send it out. I know that sounds a lot like caching, but actually it's not. Um, of course, it's not that simple because there are some dynamic elements. Um, so, of course, you have something like filters, and filters are probably different from request to request. So we add one more dimension to that, and we use a search engine. And before going to the key value storage, the front end goes to the search engine and says, OK, I need all the products for this category ID and this set of filters. And the search engine returns a flat list of product identifiers. And then with those identifiers, we go to the key value storage. And the key value storage holds the pre-rendered HTML snippet, so only the thing related to the product, um, and can return that. So we get back a list of, well, HTML snippets, still pre-rendered. And all the front end does then is pretty much glue it into an existing page template. That is insanely fast, and that um, doesn't require any sort of traditional caching, so you don't need to have a varnish in front of that. You can still get time to first byte in 30 milliseconds with that. It works really well. So as I said, we only replaced parts of the um, legacy application. So everything that's not category pages and not product detail pages is still handled by 
the legacy software, so we need to run that in parallel. What we do here is having a web server in, in front of that. Every request is handed to the new software that will then do its thing and routing and looking up the HTML snippets and eventually return them. Pretty straightforward. Now, of course, the key value storage and the search engine needs to, need to be populated at some point. I mean, it's not done on request, but there needs, needs to be some process to do that. Um, so we have a what well, we call a back-end component, which is completely um, decoupled from the front-end component, uh, which at certain points in time goes to the database of the legacy system, because as long as we have the legacy system living, that is the primary source for all the data. It's the single source of truth. So we retrieve all the product data and the category data from the database, then do the whole rendering stuff, and put the HTML snippets and the search data into the key value store and the search engine. This is completely independent from the request handling part. This could happen at any point in time. Um, and normally, you would only want to do this when data actually changed. And as long as it doesn't change, you still serve the, f um, the data from here. And you just replace it when there's something new coming. Um, in case that we have to deal with a request that is not handled by the new software, we still go there. We always send all requests to the new software and let the software decide, OK, is this a URL or a request I can deal with? Then it's doing that, and it's fine. If not, it just returns a 404. And then the web server does a fallback and hands the request to the legacy software, which then can deal with a request as it used to do. So if you go to the checkout process, for example, you will always go through here first. It will return 404, and then you go to the legacy software. That does add overhead, of course, because you always have to run through the new application before you get to the old one. Um, we try to measure that, and it's pretty hard because like, we're within the fault tolerance of, of measuring. It's like 30 milliseconds tops. And since the old software is slow anyway and takes like one to two seconds to deliver a page, sometimes even longer, that's really not, not an issue for us. But this makes it a, a really easy to add more URLs to here without changing anything in the web server configuration. OK, what does this have to do with microservices? Nothing. Because in the first step with what we did here, um, I mean, we knew about microservices, and it was already trending, but there was no real use case for us. We might have come up with having this and this as separate services. Uh, might have, uh, of course, it would have worked, because they are decoupled and independent from each other. But it would have just generated overhead at that point in time that we didn't need. I mean, the, the front end and the back end parts of that application are one repository. And that's all right. We deploy it as one anyway to make it consistent. And um, the only thing we do is we do code analysis. Um, we recently introduced uh, Defend to our in, um, infrastructure, um, which can tell you which dependencies you have in your code. So we enforce that a front-end class does not have a dependency to any back-end class and vice versa. Otherwise, the build fails. And that's all we need. Um, that's already a pretty strong bounded context, and we don't need to add additional overhead by introducing microservices. But now you understand the scenario and the basic setup that we have, especially with uh, going to the new application first and then falling back to the legacy software. That's quite important, because we launched that quite a while ago, and it works really well. So now we start removing more functionality out of the legacy application. And for example, that will be um, the cart of the user, or the basket. So right now, if you go to any kind of product or category, you'll always land on the new software. But if you go to the cart page, you will go directly to the legacy software. And everything will be handled by that. And that includes front end, as in markup and styles and JavaScript, which is really painful for our front end developers, because they need to work with both systems now. Parts of it is in the new system, parts of it is in the old system. So you duplicate stylings, and that, that's really ugly. So we need to get rid of that. And this is where, actually, the first service came into place. 
So um, what we did is introducing a card service, which qualifies as a microservice, um, which also has an HTTP API. Um, and we used that so that the, um, when the new application handles the request for a card coming in, it can tell, uh, talk to the card service to retrieve the current card of a user, to add an item to that card and everything that's needed well, for a card. Um, but the service itself hands over those requests to Magento again. But that's already giving us some really good benefits because here we have a clear, clean API that's independent of the legacy software. So our new software talks to this API and doesn't know about the fact that there's some legacy stuff going on behind that. So we abstracted that away. So that in the next step, we can actually strip out the business logic of the legacy application. But even before that, this is already pretty cool because now the front-end part, as in markup and CSS and JS, is sitting in the new application, so our front-end developers can already work with the new software, and the legacy software becomes a back-end merely. So it's not delivering any content to the user anymore. And that's already giving us a lot more um, speed regarding front-end development and rebrushing and all that. Of course, this, so moving out all the business logic from the legacy application into the service is a pretty hard task because there are a lot of dependencies. Uh, we might not be able to do that in, in the first couple of months because, um, for example, as long as the checkout is also still sitting in the legacy application, I need to have the card data available there too. So there's a lot of dependencies. Um, so moving this out is actually a, a pretty tough task, and it will probably lead to a large card service. There has to be a lot of discussion um, with the business to figure out the real business rules that we want to have, because we are not, not, we are not tied to the standard anymore provided by the um, legacy software. Um, so there's a lot going in here. Now when you write a service like this, um, there's always a framework question, right? as with any project. So, and I'm not trying to, to go into some like framework war or anything. Um, I mean, we have the usual big three. And of course, they all work for that. You can, of course, create a microservice with all that. It might just not be the best idea, because if you look at, for example, an empty Symfony project, um, there's a lot of code in there, which makes sense, because it's, it's really powerful and can do a lot of stuff. And there are all the components, of course. Um, so you get something like around 120,000 logical lines of code. And for a microservice, um, there's a lot of stuff in there you will definitely not need. Since the service is not exposed to the outside world, you don't have something like CSRF tokens, and you won't need to deal with sessions because they should be stateless. And there's, well, a template engine probably is also not needed. So there's a lot of stuff you won't need with the big frameworks. Um, that's one of the reasons why for every one of those three, there's a micro framework available for this. So we have Silex, we have Zen Expressive, and we have Lumen. And pretty much all of them go down to having, well, just some components, mostly reused from the big, uh, big frameworks, um, to give you something that is more suitable for this approach. There are also others like Slim, which gets more and more popular. Um, but it also follows the same idea. And if we look at Slim's Composer JSON, um, a reduced example, we already can see that it, it also relies on existing components like Pimple, which is a DI container. Um, and here we have Nikita Popov's fast route, for example. And this is all constructed together. This works pretty well by now because we have something like PSR7. I mean, you don't have to be a fan of the interface, but having this interface allowed this kind of component-based framework. Um, Zend Expressive would be another example. It's uh, probably too dark. But when you bootstrap a new Zend Expressive pr uh, um, project, it basically asks you which kind of component you want to use, for example, for routing. So you can also choose different implementations like fast route. Same goes for DI and for the template engine. So we still have a template engine here. Hmm. Um, oh, we can deselect it. 
Um, anyway, even though we have those micro frameworks with existing components, um, at least we decided to not use any of those. And by now it might not be that popular, but of course you don't need to reinvent the wheel, and it's not about that. Um, you don't have to write everything for yourself. But actually it's pretty easy. <laughs> and there's an interesting learning in that. Um, so we did actually write our own framework for several reasons. Uh, it's shortly above 500 logical lines of code, and it does exactly what we need for something like a microservice offering a RESTful API. And, well, one of the reasons we did that is um, we have pretty strict standards when it comes to code quality and what we consider clean code, and magic doesn't belong there in our view. So that was one of the key, key ideas to write something that doesn't contain magic. And by magic, I mean having a string that by convention is mapped to whatever controller. Uh, so you have your routes as strings. That is what we consider magic, at least. And uh, we also did it for the learning. Um, for the development teams, it was really cool to see that it's actually not that hard to write something that routes requests in a clean way, um, dealing with sessions. Well, we didn't that do that here, but for the HTTP framework we did. is also very straightforward, and it's a cool learning to see how little code you actually need to properly do that. Doesn't mean that everyone has to do it like that. Uh, we also don't advertise this to the outside world as, hey, you should use this, because this is like the best way to do it. Not at all, it's just our way of doing it. And it's a cool way to publish this and, well, do some advertisement in, in terms of, okay, if you're interested in how we work, this is something you can look at, this is how we write code. Right, uh, logical lines of code, I briefly said that, 500 whatever. We use it in several projects, it's, it's cool, it works for us. And we like to be in control of all the code we have so we don't have external dependencies. Okay. Let's talk about deployment. Um, it's pretty much impossible to talk about microservices and deployment without mentioning Docker. <laughs> um, that sort of always goes together. And there's just some basic learnings we had when, when starting to use Docker, especially for microservices. First thing, when you have a build process, don't rely on Docker Hub images um, when doing builds. It's totally fine to base your image on whatever the Docker Hub has to offer, especially the official images with like a basic Nginx or a Redis, or maybe even PHP. Um, but sooner or later, you will end up building your own Docker base images. Um, there are several reasons for that. Might be you want to have full control over what happens in that box. You want to understand really what's going on there. You don't want to rely on anyone who maintains a specific image and maybe updates versions in a way you don't want them to be updated. Um, it can also be that you don't want to have any like dependencies to external services in your build. So maybe you want to host your own private registry. And um, unfortunately, building Docker images really often comes down to writing bash-like scripts in the Docker file. And of course, there are nicer ways to do this. And one recommendation to look at would be Ansible Container. Uh, it's been a, around a while. We have always used Ansible for provisioning our development virtual machines. Uh, it can easily be used to do server provisioning. And Ansible Container is connecting your Ansible playbooks and Ansible roles with your Docker containers. So you can provision your Docker images using Ansible. And that's really cool because you don't need to write bash-like scripts anymore in your Docker file, but instead you use whatever Ansible role you have and you apply them to a Docker container and then create an image out of that. So if you're lucky, you can even reuse existing roles you have because maybe you manage your servers using Ansible. And this can easily be done by a CI server like Jenkins. So you pull new code for the base image containing the Ansible um, playbook. Then Ansible container builds the image, which is then tagged and pushed to your registry or to the Docker Hub. And then building the application image 
Well, it's essentially the same. You can do some additional checks, like running tests, of course, and then you just use your own base image that is really tailored to what you need. OK, quick excursion to the Docker world. Um, now, there's one thing that's easily forgotten when dealing with microservices and with IP APIs in general, and it, it always hurts really badly when you do it too late in the process and you notice it in, in the late state of the project, and that's versioning. Um, especially when you have a lot of microservices using, it, it doesn't matter if it's like HTTP or a message queue sitting there for communicating, you have this one API, and this one contract to the outside world, and that needs to be versioned, and you should do that like from the very start, and not when you realize, okay, I need to make a breaking change to my API, now what do I do? Normally, you want microservices to be deployed individually, so they shouldn't depend on any other deployments, since they are autonomous anyway. So let's say we have our sample setup again. We have a card service in version 1. We have the core application in version 1. Now we deploy a new version of the card service. That might introduce a new API, and maybe it changed the data structure that is needed in the request, or maybe it changed the response body. Um, since you don't know when those two applications will be deployed, and you cannot rely on the fact that they are uh, deployed at the same time, that never works anyway, you will still need to provide a way to use the old API version so that your client can still communicate the same way with the service. So you need to have a version 1 and a version 2 ready, so when you deploy a new core application, for example, that can then use version one, then you can throw away uh, version two, then you can throw away version one. And that's really crucial, and it, even if you don't use HTTP, um, but message queues, you will also need that. And actually, it's not really about versioning the API, it's also more importantly about versioning the data structures that you send around, because that's, that is what usually breaks compatibility with older versions. You change the JSON of the response body, or you need a different kind of request parameter. That's what you need to version. So maybe just add a version number to your data structure and not to the URL of your API, and deal with that accordingly. So looking at all of this and starting to use microservices in our environment, um, for everything we do right now, every new project we start, we always really ask ourselves the questions if something like microservices is what we actually need. And most of the time, it probably isn't. Microservices can solve a lot of problems, but most of them you probably don't even have, or you only have symptoms, but microservices don't really help you there. What's cool about them is that they force you to think in domains and bounded contexts to size your services correctly, but that is something that you can really do in your code, and you don't need to use microservices for that. They are especially cool when you need to scale your application on a very fine-grained level, so you have that one checkout service, and it's insanely slow, and you need to add three more instances of it, so you can scale the service, but you don't need to touch the rest of your application. That's cool, but most of the time you don't have this problem on, on the scale. Most of the time, it's perfectly fine to scale the whole application, and that's it. Because adding microservices also, it just adds complexity to your infrastructure. And it requires more maintenance and a really thorough planning and um, good setup of your deployment infrastructure. And if you have a lot of teams and you can, well, separate them by using those services, that might work pretty well. For smaller teams, I don't think you should go that way. And we already had a talk earlier today, I think, about going monolith first. That's definitely a good idea. Um, and my overall summary, um, well, I want to phrase it in a way that the SOA manifesto was, was phrasing it with prioritizing things. And I would say always prioritize componentized code over componentized systems because it's more important that your code is capsulated and has clear boundaries, and your systems probably don't need to have that unless you're really running on a large scale and have a lot of 
well, traffic on your site and need very fine-grained horizontal scaling. So this is the overall learning, and using something like the card service helped us, you know, figuring out the domain and defining bounded contexts. Um, but also, it's a lot of work to keep this up and running and get it into production. All right, um, that concludes the slides, and we have a couple of minutes left for questions. Any questions? No questions? Okay. Thank you.